everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by my friends over at a company called Real Mushrooms, realmushrooms.com. Um, Sky Chilton and his father, Jeff Chilton. I interviewed Jeff a number of episodes ago. Uh, really interesting guys. I, I really enjoyed that conversation with Jeff. Um, and it's a company that sells and distributes medicinal mushrooms in powder or capsule form. Um, I was really happy to have these guys come on. Uh, I think they were very much in alignment with the the values of the podcast. Uh, As you all know, a big part of this podcast is uh, about uh, plant medicine, holistic medicine. And I I think the benefits of medicinal mushrooms are are truly fantastic. And I think there's really a growing body of work uh, that's really showing and alluding to all of the amazing properties that mushrooms have. Um, They sell a lot of different mushrooms, um, things you've probably heard of like reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps. Um, those are all mushrooms I work with. They, they're, they're part of uh, what I consider uh, for myself a, a really holistic uh, supplement regime. Um, and the, the thing I really love about their company, not only are they really good guys, I think they're really ethical guys, um, but um, the, the product is really amazing. It's all uh, 100% mushrooms. They're organic. Uh, and, and that's really rare. For better or for worse, the supplement in this industry is, is highly unregulated. Um, and so often when you get supplements, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. You may be getting some mushroom. You may be getting a bunch of fillers and other things. Oftentimes, even when you're buying what may be a mushroom. It may not have any of that mushroom in it at all, unfortunately. Uh, Even some of the big, uh, I think even the biggest company that that sells mushrooms, actually it's not the fruiting body, not the mushroom itself. It's the mycelial, which is grown on grain, and then those things are mixed up and then sold in a supplement form. So not only are you not getting the mushroom itself, you're getting the mycelium uh, mixed with grain. So um, it's one of the amazing things of real mushrooms is it's exactly that. It's real mushrooms. So it's 100% mushrooms, organic. So you know you're getting a really good uh, product. You're getting the actual fruiting body, the, the mushroom itself, 100% of that. Um, and again, just really great guys. I'm, I'm really happy to have them on and supporting this podcast. Uh, so if you'd like a really good product, uh, you'd like to start working with medicinal mushrooms, um, check out their site, realmushrooms.com. Um, and also listeners of the show. Uh, if you go to their site, realmushrooms.com forward slash universe, you get 25% off your first order, uh, which is a really good deal. And I think once you uh, uh, start working and, and tasting their products, you'll you'll really uh, see and feel a big difference. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, I think that's it. And without further ado, here is the intro to the show. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Hamilton Souther. Hamilton is a really fascinating guy. Uh, it was really a pleasure for me to sit down and, and talk with him, pick his brain a little bit. Um, he's a he's a super interesting guy. He went down to the Colombian Amazon, I believe he said in 2001, so over 20 years ago now. So I think really uh, kind of one of the pioneers of this work, and he, he uh, founded um, one of the original ayahuasca or plant medicine centers, which is called Blue Morpho. Um, I worked for a long time at a, a, another center called the Temple of the Way of Light, and Blue Morpho was always one of the contemporaries. And, uh, um, you know, talking to people uh, who went there, I, I always heard really good things about the work that they did. I, I know a few people, my friends Daryl and uh, Samer, who also was on this podcast, and uh, just really solid people. And I think, uh, as I said uh, in, in the interview, I think that's a really uh, amazing testament to the, the quality of the work that they're doing. Um, so it was a really fascinating conversation. We, we talked about his, his, his story, uh, how he got involved in this work, uh, things like ayahuasca plant medicine, the, the apprenticeship he went through, um, things like what are or what is ayahuasca, what is the dieta, what are, what are ceremonies like. Uh, so I, I think you all will really enjoy this. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good website. Uh, you can sign up for 
for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, to all the people who have done that, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your support. Uh, and if you're able to do that, thank you in advance. Uh, one of the things I really like about that website is it works off this idea of reciprocity. So if you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, that's a, a really beautiful way to support and to give back. Um, there's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, as always, uh, helping with the algorithms is a really big help. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video. Uh, there's also video versions on Rumble and Spotify now. And then if you're listening to this, the, the audio, the podcast version uh, on Apple Podcasts, following or subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review is also a really big help. And uh, I believe with Spotify now, uh, there's also the ability to rate the show. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, without further ado, here is my conversation with Hamilton. Well, cool, man. Well, welcome. Um, <clears throat> so we were chatting just a little bit before we started, and uh, I I came down to the Amazon for the first time in, in probably 2012, and that's when I came down and, and started working with ayahuasca, and I ended up at the Temple of the Way of Light, where I, I worked for a long time. And uh, and at that time, there weren't many centers around. I mean, it's it, it's it's changed considerably. I mean, also with COVID, a, a, a lot went out of business as well. But but Blue Morpho was one of the centers that that I was familiar with. Even at that time, it was kind of one of a handful of centers that was open and and I think really well respected. Um, they they you know. Maybe we can get into this, but you know, it's a it's a funny world, the the ayahuasca world around Iquitos. But uh, you know, and you hear all sorts of stuff. But but always uh, with Blue Morpho, I I always heard really good things of, of people who went there and and came out of there, and and you know, it sounded like they were doing really deep work. So maybe just to start, uh, if you can tell the the audience a little bit about who you are, your background, and and what got you into to this line of work. Sure, my name's Hamilton Souther, and. Uh... In my early 20s, I got called to the Amazon and ultimately ended up in a traditional apprenticeship in ayahuasca shamanism and general Amazonian plant medicine. And I'm the founder of Blue Morpho. And we were one of the first uh, true retreat facilities dedicated to plant medicines. At the time, there were um, more like a hybrid of jungle touring or lodge, going to a lodge, et cetera, and then having ayahuasca ceremonies as an activity that people could participate in. But in 2002, 2003, we started to focus entirely on plant medicine as the, a destination center for people looking for transformation, healing, exploration, uh, and a, a real deep communion through the plant medicine. And so we started that work uh, in 2002, 2003. And by 2006, uh, it was starting to really take root and grow. And there was a lot of international publication that took place at that time around our work. And Iquitos really became a mecca for plant medicine and a real revival of the practices and the interests. And then right around that time, 2006, 2007, 2008, we started to see uh, other groups start to form and other indigenous groups really start to get their rightful position within this emerging uh, desire and demand for plant medicine from around the world. And that was something that we really promoted and supported. And it's been an incredible journey with Blue Morpho. It's uh, a real honor to have been trained in the traditional ways and to learn the, the you know, practices and to gain the respect of the community as a center and uh, as a, a continuation of that culture. And um, yeah, it's been really a, a tremendous honor and a gift to be able to be part of it. So, 
you came down to the jungle in Iquitos in 2002. That was when you, you first came down there? Yeah, my very first trip was in 2001. And then in 2002, I was there full time. And at that time, I mean, just in the last few years, there, there's been a real kind of flourishing of, of people talking about plant medicines and ayahuasca and, and very much in the West, even this kind of psychedelic assisted therapy, people are calling it a renaissance. But in, in 2002, uh, there was very little information or, or even just cultural awareness of, of plants like ayahuasca or, or even concepts of shamanism. So how did you, uh, how did, how did that even come into your, your, your worldview, your, your life? Um, yeah, I, uh, I studied anthropology in high school and college. And the year after I graduated, I had my own awakening. And during that period of time, I started to experience altered states from a sober state. So without the use of plant medicines or any other kind of ingestion. And uh, in those states, I actually had visions and the visions were very prophetic in the idea that I was going to go to the Amazon or I was going to go to South America, to Peru, and that I was going to ultimately find this apprenticeship. Um, I really didn't think much about it. It was really more scary than anything. I didn't know how to relate to that kind of an experience. And then I, through a series of synchronicities, got reintroduced to shamanism outside of the anthropolo anthropological studies, but as a way of explaining what was happening to me. And really through reading about South American uh, accounts of people going into apprenticeship and uh, Asian accounts and as well as African accounts, it became aware to me that I was really having what in a traditional society would be a traditional calling to apprenticeship. And so it was an, you know, an anomaly because I was an outsider and I was a foreigner and this was happening in the United States. But in terms of consciousness and in terms of transformation and in terms of my age, it was actually really well documented that when people have those kinds of experiences and spontaneous awakenings in traditional cultures, the shamans typically look at them and see if they're a candidate for training. And so, um, when I read that in the books, having already been introduced to anthropology, I, I thought, okay, at least there's something here that I can grasp onto and understand. This isn't an anomaly that's happening to me. There's a, you know, multi-thousand year tradition and history of this. And so I rooted in that. And I, that's how I turned to shamanism, not just as a study, but also as a, a way to describe and define what I was going through. And I went to the Amazon really thinking that probably nothing would happen. You wouldn't, you know find the apprenticeship people really aren't there waiting for you there aren't these shamanic lineages that have these deep visions about what's going to happen in the future that's all got to be fairy tale or sci-fi or it's being made up um, so i really went with doubts thinking probably more likely i wouldn't actually find or fulfill what was sort of in those visions or in those dreams and on the contrary it actually turned out the way that i had seen which was mind blowing in its own right. And then that forced me to root in the practices and really believe them and accept them and understand that now uh, that was enough to sort of get me into the calling and that was enough to get me in the, into the training. But you know, now I needed to train and really dedicate myself to those medicine practices. I, I know some of these things can be a little hard to, to describe, but, but when you were younger and you were having these, shamanic initiatory experiences or outer body experiences how uh, how would you describe that to someone who that may just be something that's completely out of their their worldview like what what was going on that that made you realize like something is something is happening to me that's different that that, that I can't necessarily explain through through my own cultural context yeah i mean the the first case it started through lucid dreaming and um all of a sudden I was out of my body and I was having a, a lucid experience where in that I recognized that I had met some kind of energy that would be described as a spirit or an entity in, in shamanic cultures. And it was very aware of, to me in that scene that, you know, in that dream scene that that was real. And then I thought I would just wake up in my body like normal, like you just wake up and you go about your business. But instead, I found myself at about ceiling height over my body. And then in the very next moment, I was in my body again, waking up. And it was very lucid, very clear and, uh, you know, very aware. That was sort of like a first kind of experience. Um, 
And then after those experiences, very in very quick succession, like over the course of just a month to six weeks, um, I would be just sitting and all of a sudden in like a deep meditation that was spontaneous. And then the meditation would turn completely lucid. And that was also spontaneous. And then in the meditation, there would be otherworldly beings and they would be communicative. And that would also be spontaneous. And um, I would, like I say, in the lucidity, it's like right now you're able to converse, you're talking, you know, you're in an altered state. You don't know how you got into that altered state. Sometimes you question if you're ever going to come out of that altered state, you know, when it's very early on. Um, and then I also at the same time became very aware of presences and energies in around people like. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a heightened state of awareness that people talk about, but, um, you know, you sense an energy in the room, you sense that there's something else there. It could be completely made up, but instead you actually receive information from that thing. And then you corroborate that information with other people. And, you know, there's no explanation for what that thing is, but it's giving you some kind of factual information. And so uh, that's like another kind of experience. Uh, another example, I mean, and this is like a, a great example, is I was in a, a meditation and uh, all of a sudden I was in sort of what would seem like an outer space kind of scene. There's not really earth contacts, it's sort of stars and stuff out there. And you're just kind of in this visualization. And, um, you know, then these these sort of animals show up. There's different animals. It's common to traditional shamanic culture that those things exist. And they start telling me that I'm going to go to Peru. I had no plans to go to Peru, like literally none. It was not on my radar whatsoever. And they say, you're going to go to Peru. You're going to become a shaman and uh, you're going to have to go. And I respond, I don't have any money. I have no money to go. And they say, well, you know, on this night at this time, you're going to go to this website and you're going to find a ticket there that's half price to all the other tickets. You're going to buy that ticket and you're going to go to Peru. And so I think like, okay, well, that's impossible. It's just fundamentally impossible. That's a great test. So at that night, at that time, I went exactly to the website that they said, and I'm scrolling through the tickets and all the tickets are like between 900 and $1,500. And all of a sudden there's a ticket for $411. And I hear the same voice at that moment. That's the one you're going to buy. And so that's how I ended up going to Peru. It was like literally that simple and also literally that literal. And and what was that like when you you arrived in Iquitos? Was that the area you you ended up in for the first time? No, I, when I first went, I mean, it was a, a you know very odd situation to be in, right? I think it's a good way to describe it. It was very odd. And I didn't really know how to approach this. And so I, again, say, well, how do I do this? And they go as a backpacker. So I got a backpack and I say, okay, well, where am I going to go? And they go, we'll do a journey every day. And in that journey, we'll tell you where to go next. And so I did that. And through that experience, uh, I was guided basically where to go. And so I first went to Cusco and into the mountains, and I ended up meeting a shaman there who started to train me. And that was a, a really amazing uh, meeting. And then I was taken in a San Pedro ceremony we did there on in a vision, kind of a, an aerial view of the country. And it was only later that I realized that that was the exact path I took to ultimately go into the Amazon. And the vision ended in the Amazon. And... Um, that's ultimately where, you know, I had the, the ceremonial experiences that showed me that that's where I would stay and train. And so I just followed, literally like followed the Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs until I found what I was ultimately looking for, which was a place that was going to accept me and train me. And it just happened to be in a very remote part of the forest, um, you know, really at the edge of, of uh, human habitation. And out there was a great elder who took me under his wing. And um, in the folklore, which is really pretty amazing, he had had visions for over 10 years that I would be coming. So they saw at some point somebody who looked like me was going to show up and that they were going to train him. And, um, you know, ultimately that turned out to be my story in their lives. And and what was that experience like showing up in the jungle? Um, 
I mean, at that time in Peru, in the Amazon, you, as you said, you, you had some like jungle expeditions, places like Manu, where people would go and, and do bird watching or go on, you know, little adventures down the river. But there, there certainly wasn't any sort of uh, culture of people coming from abroad and, and, and working with plants. So what, what was that like culturally for you? Just being in the middle of the Amazon with, with these people and, and, uh, you know, I would imagine going through some some pretty intense experiences on your own. Yeah, the the total experience. I mean, the the first trip turned into my first ayahuasca ceremony, and that was uh, both the most beautiful and most intense experience of my life. And um, the end of it was where it actually became beautiful. Before that, it was terrifying and uh, overwhelming. But at the end of it, everything became beautiful and there was a real awakening of consciousness. And I saw that that's actually where I was going to apprentice and where I was going to stay. And that led to a series of really big questions like, well, how do you live out there? There's literally no roads, no electricity, nothing. I mean, where I was told I would live was the last, like beyond the last inhabitant. So it was going to be go inhabit this, you know, uninhabited forest and start to live there. And somehow that's going to turn into a, an apprenticeship and learning these ways. Um, it seemed like a pretty overwhelming concept at that time. And so it started pretty, uh, you know, fundamental in, in just physical reality. Like, well, how do you get, how do you live out there? We have to get permission. So well, who do you get permission from, you know, and that's the locals and they have a, a, a community meeting and the heads of family come out and they all have to unanimously vote to allow you to live there and become part of their community. And so I first went through that experience. Um, and then, then it was learning how to just walk and how to canoe and how to fish and, you know, how to forage and how to eat. There's just no place to buy food. So, um, uh, you know, money is basically worthless other than what you take into the space, like the goods that you can buy that you can take in with you. And so it was learned to live off the land. And, um, you know, that's, I was a, like a young anthropologist, a dream really to get to be in a, a culture like that, so different to your own and then study it and learn it and live it. And so there was that aspect of it. And then there was the medicine aspect, which was, I'd say like a hundred times more intense than the a thousand times more intense than just the living in the forest part. So um, that looked like being tossed into a whole new kind of education and a whole new kind of education system, which was taught through experience and directly through the plant medicines themselves. And, uh, you know, akin to the name of your, your podcast, The Universe Within, it was all about discovering that universe within and all the teachers that you find within there and the massive dimensionality and expansion to the rest of the universe that you connect with. And it was about learning how to do that and learning how the locals and indigenous had created such an incredible body of knowledge around the plants and the, the uh, forest itself and these incredible healing arts that were accentuated by plant medicines. And that for me was just incredibly fascinating. And it was terrifying for a lot of the time, but um, I didn't feel like I had a choice to either leave or abandon the experience. It felt like it was something that I had to live through. It was a quest in its own right. And um, ultimately kind of in stages, very fulfilling. And were you communicating in Spanish or were you also learning whatever their, their indigenous language was? And, and, and also you mentioned one guy took you in, but then you also mentioned this, this aspect of community, which, which I think a lot of people overlook. Was it, was there a sense of, even if you were under the tutelage of this one man, there was a sense of also having to be accepted or, or be part of this community at large as well? Yeah. Um, the, the community out in the part of the forest where I lived, there were two communities. So there was an indigenous tribe and they don't consider themselves Peruvian. And then there was a Peruvian town, but by town, uh, they call them caserillos. They're like a collection of families that live along a part of a river. They don't really have like a, a centralized locus of town. So it's like on every two bends of the river, there's another family homesteading. And in that case, there were, uh, I think nine or 10 families at that time. 
So that was the the community. There were maybe uh, 75 to 100 indigenous, and then maybe 40, including children, uh, or 50, including the children of uh, what would be considered Peruvian people living out there, living a frontier's life, living entirely off the land. And they were community. In terms of being allowed to live out there, I had to get permission from both the indigenous tribe and I had to get permission from the the locals to uh, just know that I was safe, you know, that I was accepted enough to be there. And so uh, both of those had a process that I went through. And um, they also all had to agree that it would that the elder could be allowed to teach me as well. So that was the elder's choice, but it also had to be fundamentally accepted by the rest of the the people there. And um, through a series of events, it ultimately happened that I received that kind of uh, acceptance. In one case with the native tribe, I actually performed healing arts on the chief's grandson and in their opinion, saved the the grandson's life. And so for that, I was uh, accepted and elected as the, for that period of time, that part of the tribe's sort of lineage of medicine and healers. And so I was uh, allowed to stay there and do that. And when they had people that needed support or assistance, they would bring them to us and we would help them. I mean, that was a bit past like the, the era of, of like the Shining Path and terrorism. But were there concerns there, too, of of like narco trafficking or I mean, because some of those areas are they are quite remote. They're they're, they're very removed, you know, from from police activity. I mean, I mean it is very much like law of the land. And, and so I can I can see how that as you said, like making sure that you're safe was actually very important to them. Yeah, it was law of the land. And in fact, the year after I left that area, that entire area was taken over by drug trafficking, by narco traficantes. And I haven't been back because of that. It was deemed no longer a safe place to be able to go. It was that truly that remote. And um, so it's been, I don't know, 15 years since I've been there. So can you describe that that kind of training that you went through that that initiatory process like what what that looked like what that entailed what 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 you were basically doing during that time yeah traditional apprenticeship is uh, a really well-defined process so first you participate in plant medicine initiatory experiences and the elders look at you and they're they're now from a lineage of many, many generations of practitioners, so they know what they're looking for, is like a recruiter would. And um, then the on the plant medicine side, there's really two processes. One is the visionary plants, and the other is the non-visionary plants. And the non-visionary plants are taught through a process called dieta, which are these purifications and fasts that you go through while you drink the plants. And... Um, you learn directly from the plants under the tutelage of the of the uh, master shaman or medico vegetalistas. And so they don't use the term shaman. That's a Western uh, sort of supposition on them. That they, they're called medico vegetalistas. And um, so what they've learned is that there's a way to directly learn from the plant. And if you don't already know how to directly learn from the plant, then they say you're not ready to be initiated. Like that would be a test that they would give you. It's like, do you actually know how to learn from the plant directly? Uh, if that sounds like a foreign concept to you, you're not ready to be initiated. If that seems like an impossibility to you, you're not ready to be initiated. Uh, so they have these tests that they take you through. And in the visionary plant medicine, what they do is they uh, have a pattern of time that you drink, that you participate in these healing rituals and ceremonies. And they give you fundamentally copious amounts of these visionary plants. They give you like a, a large amount and uh, they super saturate you with them. And then they test you in every single possible way until you gain dominion over every single possible reaction to having been given these very large amounts of these plants. And um, so that could be like, learning how to contain yourself that could be learning how to uh to you know not go into psychosis or or uh 
mental discomfort or turbulence. It could be about learning how to guide and direct the visions themselves. It could be learning how to perform healing arts before the plants kick in so you don't have to rely on them. Uh, when they're when they're turning on, which can be a very difficult time that we call onset. And um, it could be under incredible duress. And so they're really, they're, it's like a series of tests of virtue to test your strength, to test your courage, to test your wherewithal, to test your centeredness. And they're just testing you and they're expecting you to grow during that process until you gain all of the skills necessary to be able to uh, be a sacred carrier of those medicines and within yourself know how to conduct yourself under any kind of circumstance. Because during your healing practices, you may face any kind of circumstance. And so it's a very holistic approach to teaching you experientially, where they they basically force you to go through a, a entire laundry list of every single possibility you could imagine. And then you learn how to deal with it. And you finally graduate when you can deal with every single possible scenario that they throw at you. And so then they say, OK, well, yeah, you've you know, you've mastered this. And then they give you a title and the title they typically give is called Maestro in Spanish. And it means teacher or it means person who's uh, came, you know, now graduated to go practice. It's sort of like getting your medical license, like being a doctor. Um, so that's fundamentally the practice. And then during that time, you do many dietas. And there are different lineages that say how much time you have to be in dieta. But in our lineage, it was about mastering the understandings. So it could be, um, you know, a shorter period of time or a longer period of time, regardless of the apprentice, just depended on how well that they mastered that experience. And so um, that was really the process. And then at the same time, there's the other part of it, which is learning how to identify the plants in the forest, because not everything's grown in a garden. So most things are just growing naturally in the forest. So you learn how to identify the plants, what kind of plants to use, what parts of the plants, how you create dose, how you uh, create the medicines, how you prepare them, how you diagnose, how you, uh, uh, you know, create different kinds of healing uh, programs for people and and how you ultimately, you know, use the forest as that uh, pharmacy. And so it's kind of all those pieces combined as training. What do you think is that balance? Because it's it, it's a really interesting topic and, and also that idea of initiatory experience. Um, it seems like in many cultures that's been lost, but but there are certainly in the Amazon there there's there's cultures that still have those. If if you go to, for example, Gabon with with iboga, um, you know, there's these ideas even built into to the the archetype of how you would use it. Something like the death ceremony, and, and as you mentioned, this idea of of ingesting copious amounts, which really seem to be bringing the organism close to this state of death. And it's, it's this interesting thing, because it seems like a lot of these initiatory experiences were trying to mimic qualities of death uh, on the psychological level, but, but also on the physical level, like really bringing the body close to the state of death. Um, what do you think that line is? And, and, and how, do you, how do you think a, a, a master, a maestro really gauges uh, how they bring that, that person to these points of, of whether it's near physical death or mental, emotional death, spiritual death? What, what, what is that, I, I think, gauge? Because I think for a lot of people, they listen to that and they're like, that's, that's crazy. Like they're, they're almost trying to kill someone, like they're bringing them close to that point of death. And yet it seems like there's so much wisdom there. There, there, there. There's so much emphasis on this dying process, which I think is something that's often kind of overlooked. I think first, as a philo philosophy, uh, death is a source of unknown and tremendous fear. And so if you're not pushed to those uh, sort of reaches of experience, that unknown is ultimately a danger for the nature of your practice. And so if you're responsible for a tribe or you're responsible for the well-being of your entire community, which is the role of the medico vegetalista, because you have to put it in perspective that they don't have uh, any other support network. Like they live isolated amongst themselves and the people that are there of the highest responsibility are the ones that can take care of the most acute and emergency needs. And so that's the role of, of the maestro. And so um, they get pushed to the to that edge 
And in some cases, like truly into near death experience and what could be seen beyond that edge. Um, you know, it's, it's an odd concept because in the West, we have an idea that death is very uh, like black and white, like you're alive and then you're dead. But they seem to think that there's this big gray zone where you're not fully dead and you're not fully alive and you can go one way or the other and you can spend a lot of time in that gray zone. Um, I think that that's a, a fundamental aspect of understanding the the nature of consciousness and understanding the nature of who we are beyond the context of the ego. And the nature of our ego just roots ourself in our self-awareness and I am. But there's a vast exploration of consciousness and connection to the other that uh, is ultimately uh, occluded from us from the ego. And so I think they push that aspect of the development to get you past that uh, nature of fear and then also awaken an aspect of your consciousness that might be dormant or, or latent to that like ever intense presence of ego. And so that's just considered a, a natural part of the training process. And um, ultimately, the way that it is conducted, at least in the Amazon, is in an understanding of how toxic the plants are. And, you know, basically ingesting a certain amount of toxicity to a point that that could cause a, a fundamental crisis for the body, for, for you. And you have to be willing and accepting of that nature to be part of the tribal societies and, and the way that they um, understand, you know, this, this phenomena of life. I don't think we can take our Western concepts and apply them because it's it's a it's a foreign concept to them what they're trying to ultimately accomplish. They don't think they're killing anybody. Like they're saying on the opposite of that, we're awakening this person to being alive. This person's only half awake. This person is going to become awakened and we have to push them to their life, not to their death. It's like literally the flip opposite concept. And they say when they're there, they're not going to be dead. Watch when they come back, they're going to have an unbelievable story about what that was like. But it's all going to happen on the on the other side of the thoughts I'm dying. So I'll ask them like, what happened? And they'll be like, oh, I thought I was dying. And then at some point, those thoughts shut off. And they'll say, yeah, you were still thinking. You can think you are alive. You can think you're dead. That's thinking. Did you get past thinking? And what happened when you got past thinking? It's like, oh, I, I, I was different. Like, that's different. And they go, okay, how? Like, how is it different? What, what did you see? What did you find? What did you discover? What was important there? And so there's this tremendous understanding of purpose. And I think because they've done these rituals for so long, you know, unbroken training of this for thousands of years, that they understand the elasticity of that, of that time. Right. So, so I've never actually seen from their own maestros an apprentice die. Right. Physically, like that's it. I've heard of it. I've heard, but I've never actually seen it. So um, you wouldn't know what actually happened or why that would have been caused. In our lineage, the plants that could cause death were held with such a respect and reverence that they would never be used in a way that to cause death. So most of the visionary plants can't be overdosed, but there are some of them that can, right? For the ones that can, the the respect around the use of those plants was, was a true boundary. Like you can use it this way and this way and this way, and it's never used outside of those boundaries. And so in that way, there was always a protection to life itself and that there wouldn't be a mistake, you know, associated with it. But you would always be pushed beyond what you thought your capacities were and beyond what you thought uh, your resilience to life was. And that's a very important part of the healing process and the learning process so that you understand uh, where the mind brings up the thoughts that it thinks it's really sick or it thinks it's you know fundamentally dying versus moving beyond those thoughts to actually understanding what that transition could look like. You mentioned a really interesting concept, which uh, some people may be familiar with. Uh, you use this word dominion, and often in, in Spanish, they'll, they'll use the, like the verb dominar uh, when they're talking about kind of this mastery over plants. And, and I, I find with a lot of people, there's often some confusion around that. Could you maybe speak a bit more about what you mean with that idea of dominion? Yeah, the 
the translations don't apply very well. So you first get this idea in Spanish, dominar. And to us, the idea of dominating something is like a power trip. And that's not what they're talking about, literally at all. It's not a power trip at all. Dominion is absolute mastery. It's like someone who has dominion of a Rubik's Cube who just does it completely, you know, with their eyes closed. Someone who has dominion of a soccer ball is just can do magic with that thing. Uh, someone who has dominion of, of language can express themselves in so many myriads of forms. They're, they're meaning absolute mastery with that concept. And um, not through that mastery, not being overpowered by other forces. And so they're talking about this idea that you learn mastery with the plants, which means you know them in every kind of oscillation, form, and way that they manifest. And so everything is uh, already experienced for you. There isn't a scenario where it's, you know, something that you don't have a frame of reference for. There can still be something that represents newness. It's new all the time, but there's always a frame of reference for it. And so that's what they ultimately mean by uh, this dominion with the plants. And that's really the, I think, key differentiator between apprentice and ma the maestro or, um, a, you know, a person who isn't trained in the arts is that they just don't have dominion. And so you see that differentiation very, very clearly. And so there's, it's a it's kind of an odd deductive reasoning, but you know the the constant concept is if you don't have dominion over that, you shouldn't be doing it. So I'd be like, do you know how to dose? If you don't know, don't do it. Like, do you have an ikaro for every situation? Do you have dominion over ikaro? If you don't, don't you shouldn't be doing it. You're still training. You need to be in the presence of someone who does while you train. And then that's that relationship between master and apprentice. And we don't see that in the West. We see that people who don't have dominion over the plants start to hold ceremonies. We see that people who don't have that presence of somebody who is a real master of those arts, kind of just guiding and supporting everybody to practice, right? It's not, it's not that they're not supposed to be practicing. It's that they're supposed to be practicing under the supervision of somebody who has dominion. And so that's fundamentally what they're describing. You spoke a bit about ayahuasca, <clears throat> which I would imagine most people listening to this have heard of, uh, but probably some people haven't, and, and some people probably don't have a, a, a deeper understanding. So how would you describe that plant? Because it, it seems like of, of the plants of the jungle, that plant in particular has really emerged as, you know, even when people are speaking about these ideas of plant medicines, like often they, they, they're referring or in, in their mind, they're thinking about ayahuasca. So could you maybe speak a little bit about that? And then also why it is you think that, that this plant in particular has really emerged so strongly? Because also, as you were mentioning, there's, there, there's various uh, visionary plants, there's various medicinal plants. You also mentioned this idea of dieta. And, and often, I think even people who are maybe familiar with dieta, they often think that, like that you diet ayahuasca. And, and there's not this concept that there's, you know, all of these other plants that, that are in kind of one's pharmacopoeia. Well, ayahuasca is a vine. So we start with that. It, the what typically people understand of as ayahuasca is Banisteria apsis capi. Uh, the vine itself chemically is, has a, a MAOI and uh, chemical in it, this inhibitor that uh, that does a couple of things. One, it shuts off an enzyme in the stomach that breaks down dimethyltryptamine or DMT before it can be absorbed into the blood and ultimately carried to the brain. Um, it also as it goes into the brain, the chemical name for it's harmaline. There's harmine and harmaline. Harmaline is considered the main, the main one. It goes into the brain and it does a number of very interesting things on a psychiatric level. The first is uh, it changes your uptake and the, in, and the inhibition of different neurotransmitters. So it allows for a temporary shift in brain chemistry that's very acute. And the neurotransmitters are very important to how we process information, our psychological state that we're in, and um, ultimately our experience of uh, chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, et cetera. So you start with the vine itself. And the vine is visionary in its own right, but it's not, quote, hallucinatory in any, any kind of form. 
it has a, a when it has a power associated with it if you drink it without any other form of of admixture. But traditionally, when people talk about ayahuasca, it's a little interesting that they use the same name for the vine, but also for the mixture. They're talking about a mixture. And the mixture is traditionally the vine, Banisteriopsis capi, with Psychotria vigoris, which is called Chacruna locally. And it's a relative of the coffee family, and they use the leaves, and there's a natural concentration of dimethyltryptamine or DMT in the leaves. And the two are traditionally brought together in the most basic form. And that most basic form is what you'll also hear in like the Brazilian churches and religions. That's called the dime or the dime. And uh also from the, the Colombian traditions, et cetera, when they talk about yahe and things like that. So if you hear it by these different names, uh, that's what they're really talking about, the combination of these two plants. Depending on the culture, depending on the, the tribe, they've also, like people like to do, adjusted the recipe. And they've added what they call admixtures to it, which are a lot of other plants in different concentrations. And each group has their own uh, mixture or brew. Now, the umbrella of all of that goes under the name ayahuasca. So when you hear one person saying they drink ayahuasca in Brazil and another person saying they drink ayahuasca in Colombia and another person saying they drink ayahuasca in San Francisco and another person said they drink ayahuasca in Paris or something like that, I don't know. Like, it's happening all over the world now. Um, they're, they're drinking some mixture of these plants, but you never know what they are, right? So in our lineage, we can work with up to 20, maybe up to even 30 different plants that could ultimately be part of our ayahuasca. But the those two main plants, the vine and the leaves, are the, the real typical core components. That's formed into a tea. And um, the tea is ingested. And it's a very it's a very potent tea. It might be one of the most potent teas in in existence. And uh, it's important to understand that that's what it is. It's a tea. And the reason why I emphasize that is because fundamentally it's so easy to make that that can be a danger because people who shouldn't be making it culturally or would never in have a permission in the indigenous cultures to make it can just cook it themselves so it isn't that there's a secret process associated with making the base concoction and so because of that there's a tremendous proliferation of this even though maybe there shouldn't be based on how potent this thing really is and uh, how important it is to be doing this with bona fide groups that know how to make sure that you're safe. You know, so, so you start with that. And then uh, the tea is typically drunk in a, a kind of ceremony or a kind of ritual. And I think if you break it down, there's three components to drinking this tea. The first component is a psychiatric component, which means it's going to work directly on the brain in terms of your brain chemistry. And there's been scientific studies that are done that have proven that some really interesting effects take place. Like one, afterwards, people are more receptive to their own serotonin, which is a mood balancing and stabilizing uh, you know, chemical that we have. Um, it's also typically serotonin manipulation is like the key to our psychiatric drugs. So there's a psychiatric component to it. During the experience itself, there's, in conjunction with the DMT, this experience that people describe as like light lightning, like their light body or their energy body turns on. And when that happens, all different kinds of symptoms of other kinds of mental illness and disease often are eliminated. So there's this, this process, this change to brain chemistry, but then this awakening of experience and during that period of time, you can really feel like your body is made of energy and the energy is shifting and changing and the vibratory state is changing. And it seems like it vibrates at a higher and higher and higher rate until all of a sudden it opens. And uh, when it does, depression, the heavy weight of life, uh, anxieties, PTSDs, addictions, those things can can just vanish. It's a It's a miraculous transformative thing. Uh, so that's sort of the psychiatry. The psychology of it is really interesting that during that process of having these the substance in you, people go on a journey in vision. They have a visionary experience. And that visionary experience is uh, really psychology. Like they'll talk about processing their life and they'll talk about going through 
places of blockages and stick points or traumas from their past, or they feel like the, a life inventory happens and these releases take place where they actually get past the things that were really bothering them or creating fixations. And that's really in their story. That's really about how they identify with themselves in life, what's happened to them along the way. And people have an, a capacity to shed an incredible amount of discomfort, difficulty, et cetera. And then on the positive side, you, you see people have a tremendous ability to make life improvement decisions. So like this massive awakening of creativity, aha moments, realizations, understandings, where people can say like, wow, I got insight into to how to improve my family. I got insight how to improve my finances. I got insight how to improve my business. I got insight into how to, how to better live. I got insight into diet and exercise. I got insight into how to live. That can take place all at the same time. And so that's really kind of like the psychology of it. And then I think the third component is this mystical slash spiritual component that uh, is also quite common where people have direct experience of all different aspects of spirituality, mysticism, and religion. And that becomes very awake and very real during that period of time. And you can also experience this supernatural intervention that helps the psychological and the psychiatric part of the experience. So people say that these otherworldly energies or these heavenly energies or these astral energies or these spiritual beings or these entities or these aliens, they'll they have lots of different names for it. In the Amazon, it's important to understand that goes under the entire umbrella of what they just call spirit. So, so they just say, oh, the spirits. And in the West, they've broken it down into all these different categories. So there's this interaction um, that becomes energetic in its nature. And it's it's not so abstract and not so mythological. It can be literally the plants that are around you. You're drinking in the forest surrounded by trillions of plants. It could be coming from the plants. You could feel like the whole jungle is supporting you in this transformation and it's consciously aware of you and you're consciously aware of it. And, and it knows it's helping you and you know that it knows it's helping you. Like these are commonalities that people describe. Um, and so that that kind of gets put into like the the big understanding of this mystical, and it goes all the way to people having direct experiences of saying the ayahuasca is sentient, that it's a kind of consciousness, it has its own history and awareness. Uh, the medicinal plants of the forest are awake and alive, and that people can interact with them, and you can receive healing and benefit from that. Uh, there's an understanding of a, a supernatural component to it, that there's something more to source or something more to the universe or something more to God. Uh, people have an ability to really awaken to those kinds of experiences. And uh, the combination of all of it is called the drinking ayahuasca. And so I think you're, you know, fundamentally it's going through that process of participating, consuming ayahuasca, and then going through those experiences that is sort of the umbrella of the entire experience. You had mentioned this idea of, of translation, like, like even with these words uh, of dominion or dominard. And um, how do you find this process, which is something very interesting because you, you were speaking about even just this one, this one brew, this tea of ayahuasca, encompassing so many different aspects of, of spirituality, of, of healing, of, of mental wellness, of physical wellness, of communion with, with, with spirit, with other plants, with animals. And it seems like in the West, we don't have something that we can necessarily like directly translate, like, oh, that's that. And, and that's what it does. Like we, we, we say, well, religion is maybe one thing and going to the doctor is something else and communicating with, with plants. That's just something kind of foreign. But, but even if that was something that was in our culture, that's something else. And it seems like with ayahuasca, what you're saying is, is there's all of these different things under an umbrella of this one plant. Um, how do you find, like this bridge building capacity of taking all of these things and, and somehow allowing someone who's coming from outside an indigenous community to really be able to understand that? Or, or, or is that just simply through the experience of working with ayahuasca, they, they become open to, to these different aspects of it? I think that's really the art of how somebody 
engages with the plant, what they know, and how they engage with the people that they work with. Um, I think one of the, the biggest uh, hurdles and needs in the plant medicine community is a way to be able to help facilitate people have a deeper awareness and understanding over a shorter period of time to grasp all of this that can, can sort of be unveiled during the experience. And I think gaining consistent language about it, um, you know, having a real clear understanding of the, the depth and the, the foundational levels of understanding. And then also the next levels of understanding are also very important to the community, especially as more people come that aren't as steeped in the cultural traditions. For the local people, you have to understand that they live in a very mythological mindset. They understand that the forest is filled with energy and that it's energy and that there are things called spirits. They understand that um, there's a, a greater mysticism to everything and that the mystery isn't scary and that they live in harmony and oneness with nature. And they understand that nature speaks to them all the time because they know how to read the signs of nature. And in the West, it's not that we're, we don't have that. It's that we've altered our linguistics to represent the nature of our society. And so what's happened as we've reduced the nature of our linguistics in the West to the point of being very focused on basically living within our society, we've objectified almost everything in our use of language. So instead of thinking of everything being a communion, we think of everything as an object. So it's like air. I breathe air. And then once you know you breathe air as a kid, air is not a mystery anymore, and you just keep breathing air forever. But if you break down the mystery of air, you ultimately realize that air is stardust, and you're breathing stardust all the time, and we don't have an explanation for where stardust came from. And so it's actually quite a mystical thing. And same thing with the plants. Like, oh, those are plants. Like, I, I just objectify that thing. Not that thing's a living being and an organism, and I don't have really much understanding of that thing. I understand its shape or its it, what the way I'm relating to it, but I don't actually understand it. I don't understand it like a biologist. I don't understand it like a chemist. And I don't understand it in terms of how the universe ever got to a point of, point of having a tree, right? Or, or a flower is described as a token of a, an affection. It's not described as a fundamental miracle. Like how did the earth ever come about creating the idea of a flower in its, in its own right? So I, I think it's just a divergence in language where if you have a community that's already very uh, a, attuned to this like basically harmonious relationship between itself and nature, thinking it's part of nature, that uh, it's much easier for them to hold this idea of kind of a, a, a multi-purpose, multi-understanding series of experiences that come through ayahuasca. I think what's really interesting is that you can bring Westerners who have literally, like I say, this ling linguistic fixation and this, this sort of level of awareness and understanding. And you can bring them to ayahuasca and they can be within one night immediately awakened to this whole other thing going on. And in doing so, um, I think it's very interesting because that it means it's innate to everybody, not just innate to the cultures that are predisposed or trained to be able to think that way. So what it does for the Westerner, if they're exposed so quickly to that, is it can create a shock. Like, I don't know how to relate to that now, and I don't know how to relate to what that that was at home. Right? It's It's not just an object anymore. And so I think that's where we as a community and as a group of facilitators or practitioners or maestros in the world need to really support and understand that there's been a big shift in the way plant medicines are being used, which is mostly that they're being introduced to people that don't have a cultural background and a, a way of fundamentally grasping and understanding the nature of all of these uh, components. And so that leaves us a tremendous opportunity to fundamentally, you know, open up the understanding and education about it, write about it, speak about it on interviews and podcasts, let people know that it's available to them, help people through an integrating process, which is how you take the nature of those experiences and really absorb the value from them and how to apply the teachings and what we learn back into our daily lives, what's applicable and what's not. It helps in awakening people's spirituality. And that's a process. And it's, it is okay that it's a process. It's a process in the Amazon. It's a 
sometimes a difficult process. But I think the uh, nature of our own spiritual awakening as a collective is very important. And so I think really it's a, it's a question of how we support people through that process, both before, during, and after, that then allows them to better relate. You used this word a while back, holistic, and, and, and sometimes these systems are referred to as like holistic systems of medicine. Um, it's kind of a big question, but, but from this more indigenous way of looking at, at, at health and wholeness, um, how is that, that health and wholeness viewed? Um, because again, I, I think that's often where translation becomes quite tricky or, or, or worldviews. Like, what is the root of an illness? Is it purely a chemical imbalance? Is it, is it some traumatic thing in our life? Um, whereas often in, in some of these indigenous systems, they, they even have a different language of, of where they would describe the, the, the root of an illness comes from or, or the, the cause of it. it. Is there a way that you can kind of describe maybe more of that holistic side of, of where they're viewing some of the imbalances or, or things that are that are not in wholeness or originating from in a way that maybe a Western person wouldn't necessarily think about? I think that it starts in a, a more expanded understanding of what you are, not who you are, but really what you are as a as a phenomena or as a miracle or as an organism. And so there's an idea that you are first and foremost spirit. And spirit to them means a kind of energy. And your spirit is not isolated or different to your body, but it's a recognition that nobody else has your body. And so it's like a unique signature to you. And that's your spirit. And they say the universe created that. And I think there's a pretty fair fundamental scientific explanation for that. So I don't think they're like making up a mythology or like a kind of religious concept around this. I think it's actually really scientific. If you look at it, no two bodies are the same. No two bodies have the same history. No two bodies are made of the same matter. Like It's really, truly unique. And they're saying, okay, of that uniqueness, this uniqueness has a, a way of being where it's full of life and vibrant and strong and, and supported in every way. Like every aspect of it is working well. And uh, they would say that the, the body and the spirit and the energy and the brain mind and the heart all have to be in this, in this state of of what would be both normal function, but also very high level function and balanced function. That should be normal. So their concept of normal is not in a state of any kind of ailment. And then they think, they don't even say you're healthy, you're just normal at that point. Like That's normal. And that that's a natural state of living in harmony with your environment, living in harmony with your peers, living in harmony with your family, living in harmony with the forest. And then there's different deficiencies that happen. There's parasites, there's uh, injuries, there's something that impacts you. There's pathogenic illness, there's bacteria, there are viruses, there are you know these other kinds of, of illnesses. There are supernatural as well illnesses that can happen that come from being uh, like put into a state of fright or, or a kind of acute trauma that they have a, a name for. They call it... Manjari. And so in an understanding of that, they say, okay, if one of these things has happened to you, okay, we have a solution for that. So if you have parasites, we can use these tree resins, you drink them and you purge the parasites. If you have this kind of uh, joint injury, we can use these poultices and we can support that joint injury. If you, uh, you know, broke a bone, we could set it and get you walking again. Uh, they don't have a capacity for, you know, advanced surgery and things like that. Like minor things like that they'll take care of. They don't have solutions for those other things. Um, so they'll say, okay, now that we've used this physical intervention, the energy aspect of you or the spirit aspect of you has been affected. 
you're affected by getting sick. You're affected by hurting yourself. You're affected by having a traumatic uh, event happen. There's, there's some kind of effect. And so then they'll want to treat the spirit aspect of you. And it's part of their medicine. It's not isolated. It's not separate. So it's not you go to the doctor for the physical and then you go to a spiritual advisor for the, the spirit part. They believe that that's a merged responsibility and that it's part of the spirit doctor to support that in you. So you fix the physical and you fix the energy. And they do that with typically different rituals or different kinds of visionary plants that are uh, supportive of that process. In the Amazonian cultures that work with ayahuasca, they use ayahuasca for that. Why do you think, you know, I, I'm sure since 2002, when you first came down and, and now we're in 2023, you've seen a huge surgence of interest, uh, especially in, in ayahuasca. Why, why do you think, and, and, and just from your experience with working with people, why do you think, or, or why do you see that, that so many people now seem to be coming to the Amazon, searching for ayahuasca, wanting to work with ayahuasca, as you said, in San Francisco or New York. I mean, there, there seems to be a, a deep, not only interest, but almost like a need, a, a symbiosis that's happening. What do you think is missing or 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 lacking or, or what's going on that so many people seem to be seeking out this particular medicine right now? Well, a lot has to do with how potent and powerful it is and that there's now a 20 year history of you know an unbelievable number of reports now millions of reports of people having had this experience and the importance that it's held for them so in some cases it's pure healing importance like the original publications about the work that we were doing people were transcending depression um at a time where there was rampant increase in depression and very few medicines to be able to help it. So there was a need. Uh, since then, there's been so many people who've had positive experiences, like really life affirming, really positive, really incredible uh, experiences that they've spoken about, that there's a kind of natural increase in demand and exploration around that. But then there's also a fundamental resurgence in an understanding of a need for both a kind of spirit, a kind of like realignment, uh, sociological and societal. And then there's, a, a, I think, a natural evolution that's taking place that people are saying there has to be more. There has to be more to what's going on. And I think in society, a tremendous fear that's going on about like just how society is and where people fit into that. And so I think you combine all of those elements together and then you see this resurgence in a desire to to connect and people understand that through ayahuasca ceremonies, there is this kind of innate connection that gets unveiled. And then for people who are looking for healing, there's the healing aspect of it. And then people who are looking for life improvement are really unlocking incredible secrets within their own awareness of this great expansion of awareness that's taking place. So if you combine all of that together, there's just a tremendous amount of positives that people are seeing through these experiences. And so through word of mouth, they're sharing them. And I think that's what's ultimately, uh, you know, causing this increase in demand and interest. You, you were saying in your kind of your, your training and this initiatory experience that, that there was like visionary plants that were used. There were non-visionary plants. Um, often I, I think people are under the, kind of the influence that, that ayahuasca is the only plant that, that's being worked with in the jungle. Are there other plants that you can talk about, whether it doesn't have to be personal or maybe it is personal, but but other plants that, that you find are, are also very useful and, and very medicinal that maybe don't get the same kind of exposure of, of, of ayahuasca, but that you still think are, are, are very useful in a, in a healing um, practice? There are a number of different plants. There's literally hundreds of important medicinal plants in the Amazon. And some of them are used in the West, like cat's claw. Uh, Uni de gato is a common one that's being used in the West, which is an anti-inflammatory and, uh, you know, a holistic remedy for cancer. So, you know, there, there are a number of plants that are really important. In the shamanic traditions, you have 
ayahuasca, which we already talked about. And then you have the medicinal trees, of which there are 40 or 50 medicinal trees. They all have local names associated with them, like Chuchuasha, Remocaspi, Capirona, Lopune, et cetera, which would be like saying, you know, I don't know, Monterey pine tree, uh, you know, a kind of oak or a aspen or a birch tree. Like there's names that they've given to these trees. Uh, those practices are very important. They're important to the training process and the purification process that people go through. And they're also very important to these, uh, these long-term physical healings that, uh, people need. And so we actually at Blue Morpho are, have a dieta center where we offer these different plants, not just ayahuasca, but we actually offer the different dietas and we offer the, the ability to work with these other plants. And it's a very deep and profound experience, although not visionary typically in the hallucinatory sense. So in the visionary sense, they're, they're very profound for people and tremendous kinds of transformations and healings take place while people go through it. And there's also tremendous awakenings and understandings and transference of information and knowledge. Um, you'll hear about the Sanangas or Sanangos. So there's Chirik Sanango, Uchuk Sanango, and then there's many other names, Lobo Sanango, Achuni Sanango, et cetera. So, but Uchuk and Chirik are the two that are uh, most typically used. So the Sanango dietas are also incredibly powerful and uh, something to be very uh, like held with a tremendous amount of reverence. They're, there's a, they're very powerful. A lot of people who've gone through those with us say that they have consistent life change from them for years. So they set their intentions and they go through it and it might take three, four, five years to fully process in their life everything that they intended and that their life just just doesn't ultimately gain stability again until all of those changes are made and then their life flourishes um there's the there's an interesting tradition that uses mapacho tobacco which is uh not the same as pipe tobacco pipe tobacco is a nicotiana Ameri americana and this is a nicotiana rustica it's a, it's a different plant. It's like tobacco. It's about six times more nicotine than your normal tobacco, but it's used ceremonially and um, people use it for healing all different kinds of illnesses, as well as doing dieta and purifications and purges associated with it. Um, so all of those plants are are part of the healing tradition. And then there's other ones like uh, chanca piedra that's good for kidney stones and gallstones and um there are different grasses, these pampas they're called, that are used in teas. There's there's ahosacha that's used when you're uh, having a cold. There's sueldo con sueldo when you have a, a joint injury. There's many, many anti-inflammatories that are incredible, just absolutely incredible in the in the Amazon that come from different tree barks and the roots of different plants and you combine them into a tincture and you drink it and it's it's as fun it has as much function as taking anti-inflammatory pills or even more so so there's literally hundreds of plants that are of tremendous value and i would hope that over time they would be both uh created or, or farmed in a sustainable way and that they would also become part of what people use and recognize as medicine. You spoke about in, in your own process, the, this idea of, of doing dieta to, to learn more deeply and experientially from the plant, and that that's something you also offer at Blue Morpho. Can, can you speak a bit more about that? Like, what is a dieta? What does it entail? Why someone would do it? And, and, and who, like, what kind of candidate that that, that would a, a, appeal to? Sure. To start, there's three people that, uh, three main groups of people that do dieta. So the first are people that are learning. Um, the second are people that are ill, that are actually sick with something that they're trying to heal and get over. And then the third are the people that are, are um, they're like really training. They're training to be shamans. And so you learn from dieta. There's there's the healing aspect of it. And then there's actually training in the shamanic aspect of it. Uh, so if you find yourself in one of those three categories, it's an incredible thing to do. And I would also open it up that it's an incredible practice for weight loss as well. And, and learning how to come into harmonious balance with the body. So it may not have the, the main mindset from the Amazonian perspective because 
they don't really have the idea of obesity and the traditional use of the medicine. So they don't think of it that way. But if you have a problem with maintaining your own weight and maintaining your own health from food or food addictions, et cetera, this can be an incredible practice to make a pattern disrupt. It's not a yo-yo diet. It's not a, a you know nine day weight loss fad. It's not that concept. It's actually a really deep communion that takes you into a very direct relationship with a plant that's going to become an ally of you and provide you extraordinary support to help you fulfill your intention. So if your intention is to learn how to have a more harmonious relationship with food, that dieta will help you ultimately achieve that. So I would think that that could be, you know, something that could actually help in Western cultures, obesity as a way of, of actually retraining our relationships to, uh, to food and to weight. But again, this isn't about vanity, nor is it about, you know, a beach body, et cetera. This is really talking about something very, very deep to you about your health and well-being. Um, but if you, if you look at the principles of the dieta, um, fundamentally you, you, you do a, a very reduced caloric intake diet for a period of time. It's almost a fast. And while you do that, your body becomes very receptive to what you ingest. And you mostly ingest water and tea made from the plant that you're working with. And so it's less importance on the amount of calories you have. There's enough calories to be able to stay you know, lucid and, and coherent. And you're not, you're not just doing a water fast. Like you eat um, very rudimentary foods that chemically don't get in the way of this deep communion that's established with the plant that you're working with. And so this is an indigenous process that was discovered thousands of years ago about how to truly bond and gain the support from certain kinds of trees or certain kinds of plants that uh, ally with you. And you set intention to them and with them. And that's very much like a very deep reasoning of why you would be doing that in the first place. Like you're learning something or you're purifying something or you want to heal something. Like you could have a gastrointestinal illness. You could have a, a joint problem that you just just doesn't get healed. And you're asking deeply, like a deep prayer within yourself for something to intervene and help you. And so you do that, you go through that process and it can take anywhere from you know, seven days, nine days, 15 days, 30 days, depending on the culture and the dieta. The shortest are anywhere from six to nine days and the longest I've ever heard about are a year long or, or longer. And during the dieta time, you don't have salt, you don't have added oils, you don't have added condiments, you don't have added spices, et cetera. And you just eat these very rudimentary uh, series of foods and you drink the plants and you really are in a deep state of meditation and communion with the forest, with the plants the entire time. It's very relaxed. It's very calm. It's supposed to be that way so that this subtle essence of this plant has a way to actually be able to help you and heal you. And typically the plants that are used in dieta are known to have medicinal properties in their own right. So they're not only used only in dieta, they're also used in other ways. And they have this medicinal property and you're asking the, not only for the medicinal properties in a Western medical sense, like I took that supplement, I'm ingesting these properties, but you're also asking for this supernatural aspect of it or its spiritual aspect, its energetic aspect to ally with you and create healing. And it's part of the traditions in Amazonian medicine that not only is that real, but it's repetitive and consistent and that that support is part of their medicine. You spend a big part of your life uh, training in these these traditional ways and practices, and 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 being around indigenous people, learning uh, these very old systems of working, um, which I think is really beautiful because there 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 is there's a lot of wisdom there. there there's a lot of knowledge that's that's been passed down over countless generations. Um, one of the things that, that's really happening with a lot of these plants is they're they're very rapidly moving out of their their kind of indigenous environments, uh, as you said, into San Francisco and New York, and 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 very much now being synthesized and and uh, kind of also falling into a particular way in the West that that we work with these, which is through this psychologized model, uh, often referred to as something like psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do, 
like what do you see the the potential benefits of that being and 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 do you see potential drawbacks and 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 what are those well, first of all it's happening and so i think with any kind of massive expansion of interest there's and need there's going to be an evolution that takes place and you have to accept the evolution so i think of it as you have the indigenous you have the MD, PhD side, and sitting within that is a massive global culture that is seeking a kind of intervention experience and healing that doesn't fit within those two boxes. And um, because of that, I think we have to embrace and understand that this is now a true globalization of the use of these plants and of these practices. And when that happens, that is a call to everybody in the community to now provide education and now to provide wisdom around it and safety protocols and practices and standardization. And so in alignment with that, we've created the Blue Morpho Academy to start teaching the nature of these practices outside of the traditional lineages and outside of the Western medical systems so that people actually have at their disposal the information that they need to be able to safely and professionally engage with these plants or know how to find an appropriate sitter, coach, facilitator, or master facilitator, and include the training programs for people to embrace these new roles that are going to come out through the psychedelic renaissance. And so I think we have to actually embrace the fact that uh, it, we, don't, we, we can't respond with a reactory model. It can't be that we now create an opinion about the fact that this is already happening. It's happening everywhere. And so we have to actually now support the nature of the fact that it's happening. And the way we can do that is by supporting the indigenous tribes and their cultures and being grateful to them for having been stewards of this medicine for so long and being grateful to them for having shared it outside of their, their pure tribal lineages, which is why it's now expanding through the rest of the world. And they made that decision and they made that decision when they saw their cultures dying and they saw that they needed to share it with people who had interest. And it just happened that the people who had interest weren't born in their tribes and didn't have the same skin color, but they had interest in their heart and in their soul about this. And they saw the benefit in it. And they told the indigenous people that they were of incredible value to themselves as a, as a unit and as a tribe and as a, a nation of indigenous, but also to the rest of the world. And they helped re rekindle this incredible love for these ancient practices that have survived to today. And so I, I think there will be regulation and shift in law and change. There will be a, a huge uh, burst of science that will now be applied to it, including uh, machine learning and AI to perfect and change the molecules. And then it's going to be put under the same same umbrella name again. Well, an ayahuasca pill is not ayahuasca. And an ayahuasca analog is not the same thing as ayahuasca. And they're all called ayahuasca. Right? And so I would like our academy to put out an incredible amount of education and support the people that are really interested in this to, to get the kind of training and the understanding that they need to have this be considered a bona fide form of treatment and medicine and embraced both in the medical side and also in the unregulated side of using supplements and, and supportive things that people do over the counter or with themselves or that they you know have the ability to use all different kinds of herbs and medicinal plants and things like that in the form of tinctures and teas and that they would understand how to be able to use them. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to embrace this transformation and change come to it with an, an open heart and an open mind, know that not everyone will treat it with the same level of reverence and respect that it really does deserve, but that doesn't shadow and color the fact that the majority of the community does. And that we don't have to focus on the negative edge cases. We need to focus on the cor corpus of, of knowledge and understanding that is still held within uh, indigenous traditions and cultures and the people that have helped expand on that and now provide a kind of standardization associated with it. And so that's what we, we hope to achieve with Blue Morpho Academy. And we also hope that many other people in the, the community embrace that same line of thinking and really support that level of professionalism, safety, and excellence that I think the plants deserve. 
And and how would you describe your role as as a maestro, as a curandero? Because one of the things that that obviously is very different, uh, as we were talking about, as this work goes out in, into a more Western context, especially in that. A clinicalized or medical setting is one thing that's very absent in that setting is someone who would be described as a maestro, a, a curandero. So how would you describe that, that role you're in? What are you doing? What is a maestro doing? What is a, a curandero doing in that ceremonial space? And, 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 and like, like, what is the function and, and, and why for you is that also an important aspect of this work? The, the role is diverse. And one of the reasons I think it's fundamentally important is because it's been important for so many generations and traditions that there's a reason behind it. And there is a, a number of important aspects that you have to support a ceremony with or support the use of these plants with. And without that, there's something dramatically missing. And so it starts with an, a, a complete understanding of what everyone could go through in the room. You're the only person who has that understanding. And in terms of safety and potential you know, emergency intervention, you're the only one with the training to know how to intervene appropriately in these altered states of consciousness. So it would be an equivalent to like uh, having an emergency happen during a surgery and you don't have any surgeons there who are trained to know what to do from a, a long lineage of understandings that have been passed down of generation after generation after generation, seeing literally every scenario that is uh, ultimately unveiled through these, these healing processes. So one is just the, the coverage of understanding and training that you go through. The next is that you actually have a real active role in the management of the ceremony itself. So it's not that you give something and in essence, like you, you hand it over a tea, a person drank the tea and your role's over. On the contrary, your role just started. So first you have to know how to dose and no dose is the same. And you have to be able to read the other person and know from them the appropriate dose. And like I said earlier, if traditionally, if you don't know how to do that, you're not supposed to be serving. So you first start there. Then once you've served somebody, you now start to oversee the nature of the experience. And fundamentally, it's your responsibility that they stay in the visionary realms, not just in the physical space, but in the visionary realms, in a safe, contained series of visions and experiences. And that takes an enormous amount of training to know how to do that. So you don't give somebody very potent plant medicine or psychedelics and then leave them to just have whatever happen, like lighting a fuse. And then it just happens like a chain reaction until that thing like, you know, kind of wears off. That's like a very Western concept. The traditional shamanic role is not like that. It's constant intervention. And the intervention comes through a language that's completely foreign to the outsider. And it comes through chanting and ikaro that is its own language in its own right. And so you have to know the language of Ikaro to be able to guide and support the nature of that ceremony in all of the different subtleties. And I've tried to describe it before, but it's, it's like in, in 10 seconds of Ikaro, you can have as much information as an hour speaking. You can communicate into the ceremony hours of what it would take to say, word, 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 word with Ikaro. And it's a language that the maestro has developed over, again, thousands of years and have passed down generation after generation after generation. And so there's the nature of that language and knowing how to, to do that and, and support that. There's a, a energetic room management that is very important if you do ceremonies with multiple people in the room at the same time. is as a phenomena of energy being shifted and exchanged between people. And you have to know how to manage that and not have that happen. Uh, there's all the different crisis managements, meaning like you have people going into altered states of consciousness and you have to know the state that they're in and how to move them from one state to another, to another, to another, especially if there's ever a point of difficulty that somebody goes into. Um, like these are just the beginnings. 
These are just the beginning pieces of it. As you get deeper into the practices of the medicine, there's the specific energies that are found within the visions themselves that you know how to guide, create, and direct, which actually cause the kinds of transformation and healing that you're looking for. So in the Amazon, it's not, I gave them a cup of ayahuasca, and because I gave them a cup of ayahuasca, they received healing. It's, I gave them a cup of ayahuasca, and then I connected them with this kind of spirit and this kind of energy and this kind of being and this kind of plant and this kind of animal and this kind of divinity and this kind of support. And because of all of that combined, the person received that healing. Right now, somebody could say, oh, well, that's just mythology. That didn't really happen. But then you ask the participant and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. In my vision, I saw this thing and then I saw this thing and then I saw this thing and it's in the exact order that the master shaman presented it in. And then you hear in a group of 20 or 30 people who did this together, they go, but, but wait a second, during that time, he was doing this for me. And, and the other person says, no, I was, doing, I was getting this. And, and the other person says, I was getting that. And then you hear that from 20 different people. And you ask the master shaman, were you doing that for all 20 people at the same time? And they say, yeah, I was. That's exactly the art that I perform in that room. And then they say, well, how do you do that? And, you, and they say, well, you have to be trained. It's not something you can just put in words and describe. You have to actually be trained in those states of consciousness that make that possible. And that that's something that's fundamentally, again, repeatable and expressed over time and handed down generation after generation. And so the, the role is so diverse that um, I think that it's of in incredible importance. And if you don't have that, you're ultimately removing something of that importance. Now, that doesn't mean an experience without that is, you know, bad or wrong. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen. It just means that you're missing this incredible amount of uh, support and purpose if you have that person there. And if you don't, you have to realize that you've, you're not having what they would call an ayahuasca ceremony. You're having something else. And... Maybe it needs a different name, or maybe it needs a different category in the West to not create confusion. So the, the work you're doing at Blue Morpho, how, how would you describe that? And, and, and who are the people that you think can benefit to, to come down to, to the center? Yeah, I mean, the work that we're, we do is right now, I mean, we have the three main components. We have retreats where people come for a week at a time usually six days, and they can participate in four ayahuasca ceremonies. And um, the purpose of the ceremonies is uh, really a focus on this idea of medicine that I've been describing and source or divinity and the combination of that and the, the true transformative power of that. So the people who get the most benefit from it are people who are really looking to improve their lives and take their life to like the next level of, of success and improvement for them. If that's somebody who's improving uh, an aspect of their, their family, their life, their economic situation, their business situation, that applies. If it's somebody who needs a specific healing and transformation to be able to improve their life, that applies. Uh, if it's somebody who needs spiritual exploration and development in spirit and, and, and a deeper awakening, that applies. And our work is really focused on the expansion of consciousness and the awakenings that we are individually going through and collectively. And it really applies for people who are interested also in being part of a community of uh, explorers and like-minded people who really understand the importance and the benefits of these kinds of experiences. So they understand the importance of spirit and spiritual awakening. They understand the importance of expanding consciousness and learning and growing while being alive. They understand how that adds to healing and life improvement and family relationships, finances, business, personal health. They understand how you and want to improve life through these means. And they're the people that really come on our retreats. Um, the other aspects of our work is also dieta and coming for these purifications, which it supports all the other things that I just said. So people coming for deep communion, really deep spiritual growth and development, really potent and powerful transformation and healing. And so that's the nature of dieta. And then we also have the academy. 
And the Academy is part online and it's also part in person. And the Academy has online courses, uh, coaching and integration programs, and uh, retreat and dieta that are all intercombined to be able to help you learn. And you can do it for a personal pursuit if you're interested in doing that, but you can also do it uh, for a career pursuit. So if it's if you're interested in just really going deep into your own practices, having your own plant medicine or psychedelic practices, et cetera, it's great for you, but it's also great for you if you're interested in being a professional sitter or coach or facilitator. And if you really do master all of those roles, the potential to be a master facilitator, which would be the equivalent of a master shaman. And so those programs are just starting now, but um you know, a sitter may take three to six months, depending on how much of the skills you've already amassed through your life up until now. And a coach would be one or two years, uh, sorry, six months to a year to two years, depending as well on, on how much you've learned in terms of mentoring and coaching already, like being a life coach or mentor or success coach or mentor. And to bring plant medicine into that and be certified, you have to already be a coach or you have to take other coaching courses and, and pass those as well. Uh, and then a facilitator can take one or two years and a master facilitator could take four to six to 10 years. What do you think are qualities that are important if someone is looking to to work with the something like ayahuasca? What do you, because there, there's so many options out there now, what, what do you think are some of the the good things that, that if someone is out there and looking and taking in all this information, like things that you found from your own work that are good signs of th that, that someone is going to receive uh, good quality work and, and be in a good environment. I, I mean, I think you, on the personal side of it, you know, for the bond to, to you, if that's a good fit, uh, it requires having the experiences and feeling called and feeling like you really you really resonate with the kinds of energies and experiences and the stories that people talk about and have. I think for working with any kind of plant medicine, you have to know that you're service oriented and that you like to be able to support and be there for other people. The role of the the sacred healer or sacred doctor, et cetera, is, is very real. And so it's part compassion and it's uh, a love and dedication to the practices and the medicines themselves, the experiences that people have, supporting people through those transformations. Um, so I think you have to know that you're giving in that way and that you, you're you also very patient in your, in your core in terms of interacting with people because it's typically a long process. And it's not just a, an instantaneous transformation. Usually people go through their own processes in the psychological part of that journey as they awaken. So I think you want to know that you, you have that desire to be supportive to other people. You have those core skills around patience, the listening skills to be there for others. You like using your time that way and that you really do love the experience of working with the medicines because you'll work with them all the time. So I think that that's the core as an individual. And then if you're looking to go to a center or to a group of people and experience this, I think you have to be very discerning because it's uh, unregulated. There is there isn't a, a group that defines the quality of practice. And so there's a because of that, a wide variety of the quality of practice out there. So while everybody might be saying that they have great mushrooms or they have great ayahuasca or you know they have great other kinds of visionary experiences for you you need to really understand if you resonate with them and if you bond with them if you resonate with them if you feel uh, good with them if you feel like you've gotten your questions answered and i would ask questions if i had them if you feel like you're being listened to if you feel like they're interested in your safety and well-being and you've heard testimonials from other people who have been there and you look at them and you resonate with their energy as well, that I think you have a really good chance of knowing that you're in a group that you're going to harmonize with and that that will ultimately be positive for you. Yeah, great. And is that where you are full time? You're, you're involved uh, on the ground, working in ceremonies, working with the online programs, all, all of the different aspects of it? Yeah, I'm involved in a number of projects and Blue Morpho is both my you know creation and my passion. 
And it's a calling and something that I've done as part of my career to share it with it, as many people that were interested. And uh, also, you know, as a proponent for the plant medicines in general and as an advocate on a global level. And at Blue Morpho, I participate in all different aspects of the organization and am present on the retreats and supportive in ceremony. And I lead and guide different ceremonies and dieta processes and stuff. I'm also part of the coaching programs and mentorship programs. And so if, you know, people resonate with me and, and you know, like where I'm coming from, I'm a huge part of how all of this, uh, you know, kind of continues to evolve. And um, I love the I love the the work itself and the ceremonial aspect. And then I'm also involved in a, a number of other projects as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Hamilton. Is there anything else uh, we we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about? I would just say that uh, you know we're in a we've talked a lot about the, how the ancient has come into the modern, and we're in this uh, incredible time of transformation. And I think one of the biggest disrupts in history has already just happened, and it's around artificial intelligence. And we've been discussing plant spirit intelligence, and I think we have to look at all of the different kinds of technology and just to be very aware of of this expansion of consumer artificial intelligence and uh, what's going on in the space. This is a, the biggest disrupt that has happened um, that anyone has ever described in terms of technology and transformation for us in terms of how it will transform society. And that to me represents a, a, an importance for everybody, including the, the spiritual traditions, the modern traditions, every sector of the economy, every aspect of our, our societies and our families. And so I would um, just, just put a call out there for everybody to become aware of this and understand how fast the space is changing and evolving. And I'm directly involved in it in a project-oriented sense as well, both on the spiritual side and on the technology side. And um, it's very, just very important to, to pay attention to this. Um, try to understand it to the best of your abilities and uh, interact, interact in the space around this. It's not something to be approached with fear, but the transformation that's coming is very real. And so uh, on, on that note, we have a project that's launching that's called God AI, and it's a, a system of uh, AI driven and empowered spiritual advisors that have been trained on the corpus of spiritual and mystical and religious texts from around the world. And you can go to the platform at godai.ai and uh, ultimately connect with an AI version of a priest or an imam or a shaman or a guru or a monk that has been trained on all of the mystical and religious and spiritual uh, aspects of those traditions. And that that's just a, a small, small drop in the, this vast ocean of power that these techniques have, uh, these tools have to ultimately disrupt. And so uh, for people who are interested in plant medicine and spirituality um, that don't really feel that they're like a techie or something like that, check out godai.ai and just see the power. You can ask it anything and it'll answer in real time streaming and come directly from the, uh, the teachings themselves of these different traditions. And it's a good starting point to just understand how powerful this is and how it can disrupt ultimately everything. Well, that sounds like a huge Pandora's box of a whole nother conversation to go into. <laughs> uh, that'd be amazing for maybe another conversation. Uh, Cause yeah, that, that is a, a very fascinating aspect of, of all of our lives. That's, that's transpiring right now. Um, Hamilton, thank you very much for sharing. I, I appreciate your time and, and the work you're doing and your dedication to, to the craft and, and, and the science and the art of this. And uh, I think people like you are, are super important as this work uh, continues to evolve and move forward and, and, and uh, just kind of become part of the cosmovision of, of, of the world at large. So I thank you for your, your, your service, your dedication. I think it's beautiful what you're doing. Uh, as I said, before we started this, the, the people that I've talked to have been to Blue Morpho who, who've worked there, they're, they're, they're solid people. So, uh, you know, I mentioned Daryl and, and I think, uh, Sam Air, maybe who you also know, he was on the podcast and, uh, everyone I met has been really, really stellar people. So I, I think that's a, a really good sign to, 
to the work that you guys are doing and a, and a testament to yourself. So thank you, my friend. Oh, thank you very much, Jason. It's been a pleasure for being on the podcast and thank you for having me. And I look forward to another one anytime to discuss some of these other topics. <laughs> Great, man. Great. Well, thank you. All right, everyone. That's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Hamilton. Uh, it was really a pleasure for me to sit down and chat with him to learn a bit more about his story. Uh, as I was saying, I think he's really one of the pioneers in this film and, and really a guy with, with a lot of depth and a lot of knowledge. And uh, I think important that, that voices like his uh, really get out there in this world as this work really begins to spread. Uh, because there is a lot, of, a lot of depth, a lot of wisdom, a, a, a lot of just just uh, things that, that can't even necessarily be taught as this work gets out there, that, that really just come from, uh, from a place of experience, from a place of training, from a place of learning from really good people. So um, I hope you enjoyed that interview. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, Patreon is a really good way. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Um, to all the people who have done that, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your support. And if you are able to do that, thank you in advance. Again, I really like the idea of that platform, platforms like it, which work on this idea of reciprocity. Uh, so if you feel like you're gaining from uh, something from this, this podcast that gives you the ability to support and to give back. Um, <clears throat> If you can't do that, helping with the algorithms is always uh, really useful. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, uh, that's a really big help. Uh, and then if you're listening to this on the audio version on Apple Podcasts, leaving a starred rating and a short review is a really big help. So I think that's it. Uh, my guest coming up after this, uh, I ho I'm hoping to interview a local Cardo uh, gentleman who whose name is Victor. Uh, so I'm hoping to get him on. Um, Joe Moore from Psychedelics Today is coming on. I was on his podcast a while back, so he's coming on mine. Um, and another local guy who's into... I think a lot of esoteric practices, mystery schools, Andrew, uh, hopefully he'll be able to come on uh, before I actually leave for an extended journey. I'll be in um, Portugal and Ireland running Dieta. Um, I think we're almost sold out for those, um, but you can check my website, nicotianarustica.org. And then in uh, July and August, I'll be going to the States, to Colorado and New York. And I believe there still are a few spots available for those retreats. Uh, so if you're interested in, in dieting, working with plants, working with tobacco, different trees, uh, there's some really good opportunities there. And again, you can check out my website, nicotianarustica.org. So I think that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope this finds you all well, and I will see you all on the next episode. Mm -hmm.